Let's get to our Wrap the Week segment. I wanted to start with a, a uh, survey that we asked all of you. We have polls running pretty consistently on our Stock Charts TV page, which is stockcharts.com slash TV. Also on our YouTube channel, if you're a subscriber, you'll get our polls right through YouTube and also on our Twitter channel. So make sure you're checking us out anywhere that you are and uh, answer the polls when you can. We asked you recently, which asset class performs the best through the end of March, 2021? So a first quarter outlook, what's doing the best? And, and interesting to ask these questions because I'm always fascinated by what's happening in the short term and how that might impact everyone's long-term discussions. I bet if we ask this question in December versus you know, today or the last couple of days, our answers might have been different because we certainly saw some upside resolution to stocks and S&P getting the number one uh, uh, amount of votes of almost 60% of you. 32% said gold, only 5% said bonds, 4% said the dollar. So as a contrarian, I'm immediately drawn to the charts of the bond prices and of the US dollar and thinking, does that mean they've gone down enough if no one pretty much thinks that they're gonna, uh, gonna do better? Uh, than these other assets in uh, in March, as I mean, you know, through March, does that mean that we are uh, you know overextended and ready for some sort of pullback where everyone will be caught on the wrong side of things? But you know, it's hard to if I would answer this, I would probably say gold, um, and and I know that's probably an unpopular answer now, given gold and gold stocks breaking down, stocks and uh, and and sort of offense, consumer and and so forth breaking higher. But I do think we're going to have plenty of uncertainty that comes uh, over the next couple of months, and and you know, I think it could be a crapshoot between the two of those. Um, to uh, to be honest, great uh, you know great great poll responses and thank you all very much as always for keeping uh, you know keeping an eye on that as much as you can answer and uh, share your thoughts with us we appreciate it. Let's get on and continue our wrap the week adventure here. I wanted to start with uh, a weekly review of where things have played out. I don't have some great labels on here right now, uh, so let me just walk you through what we're seeing. This is starting at the end of last year, so starting basically at the end of. Uh, of last week's trading, look at the last five trading days and looking at the performance from the starting point to where we're at. The number one performer, as you could probably guess by the fact that it is light years ahead of everything else is indeed Bitcoin, which is up 35% just year to date. Well, that shows you the movements that we've had there. And if you missed it, Bitcoin has accelerated to the upside, breaking above 40,000, uh, which is not long after it broke above 30,000 and uh, a couple months after it broke above 20,000 for the first time. So, you know, all of this has happened very quickly. You know, this is a new era of sorts, I think, in terms of cryptocurrencies and, you know, sort of adding a, a zero to a lot of people's interpretation of it. The question now is something like Bitcoin is, you know, how far is far enough where people start to question the viability of uh, of prices being at that level. That's the nature of any sort of bubble scenario. When something goes up an order of magnitude, you know, a couple order of ma magnitude, you have to question, you know, at what point do things sort of right size and you recalibrate. And if you think about what Bitcoin did up until 20,000, it then took quite a while for it to get above it for good. And maybe we're nearing 40, 50,000 is where a, a similar sort of recalibration may uh, take place. I'm not sure. What I do know is that the trend has been positive and remains positive until proven otherwise, up 35% just in the last week. After that, we sort of had the S&P 500 here, just up about, up about 2% uh, for the week uh, as, we, uh, as we lock in the closing prices. So what else outperformed uh, stocks here in Brown? We have crude oil, which is up 7.3%. So clearly one of the better performing assets, small caps not far behind, up 6%. This is emerging markets. Uh, up 6%. So, you know, the similar characteristics here, this is sort of weak dollar plays and you can see, uh, you know, small cap stocks doing well. It's a lot of energy that's, uh, you know, energy and financials are a pretty big weight in the uh, small cap indexes. And so that's sort of fueling that with higher crude oil prices and emerging markets obviously tied to uh, commodities as well. What underperformed bonds were the weakest performer over the last week down 4%. Here we have gold in the golden color down 2.8%. Flat for the week was the US dollar uh, ETF, the UUP. And then just quite pretty much in line with stocks, but just a tick below uh, was the uh, NASDAQ 100 down 1.7%. So overall stocks up about 2%, couple things outperforming and it's things related to energy, emerging markets, and then obviously cryptocurrencies really driving uh, out of all those assets uh, much, much higher. Let's continue our journey by focusing on the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is where I like to spend as much time as we can on a Friday just to 
uh, make sense of things and sort of go through a consistent process. If you've not seen this before, and this is your first time watching the show, the way you can get to this is actually if you go to uh, the Stock Charts homepage, go to the Articles tab, which is our sort of our homepage for all of our uh, contributed material up here where it says all Stock Charts blogs. You can go to my page, which is called The Mindful Investor, and click on Live Chart List. It'll get you to this page that we're looking at uh, right here. And it basically is a curated list of charts that I've uh, that I maintain pretty regularly and walks through my sort of basic macro process for understanding what's working and what is not. We start with the S&P market trend. This is a weekly chart looking at uh, uh, weekly data going back five years. And we're looking at the S&P versus some exponential moving averages. The long-term model turned positive here in June of last year and has remained extremely positive since really speaking to the resilience of the resiliency of the uptrend uh, off of the March lows. The medium term trend sort of gave a head fake here in October, turned more positive uh, the first week in November and has remained positive as well. And that just speaks to the trend uh, accelerating there. It originally turned bullish in early May of last year, which is about two months, month and a half after the, uh, after the bottom then remained positive. The short term model for me, I usually use the daily chart as a short term gauge, but just as a, as a, uh, as a holding, uh, Point for that, uh, I keep the, uh, the, I look at the S&P versus its three, I'm sorry, it's five week exponential moving average here in green. And so whether or not we're above or below that uh, tells me the short term trend, just a quick, uh, a quick uh, estimation of that. It actually was below the five uh, week exponential moving average. You see the low is down here. It actually went below that. And that was on Tuesday as I think where things were getting heated in the market sort of uh, wiggled around a good amount and sold off a bit into Wednesday, um, you know, it got below, but closing the week uh, to new highs, new all-time highs for the S&P again. And that means long-term, medium-term, short-term, the trend is positive, and that's about right. You know, the daily chart of the S&P continuing to go higher, I always tell people, um, you know, when a market's going to all-time highs, I, I tend to assume that that's going to continue. The path of least resistance tends to go with the breakout until proven otherwise. And so I think what you look for are things like bearish divergences, signs of exhaustion, signs of extreme sentiment and breadth that would indicate some sort of internal weakness or an exhaustion of buyers. Uh, but other than that, I tend to assume that trends are gonna continue higher. You know, earlier on in my career, I was much more of a contrarian. I spent a lot of more time with hedge funds. And so I was thinking a lot about more swing trading types of ideas. And when things get really heated, I would immediately look for a reversal lower and, and time working with uh, you know, a lot of time working with, uh, you know, money managers and, and long-term investors reminded me of the value of just sticking with trends that are working. And so I, I, I adapted a, a great deal to that idea of trend following. That, that really informs a lot of the comments that I make for you on the show now is based on that experience. So when things are going to new highs, I'm all for projecting where things might go. I'm all for identifying a level at which it might be interesting to see if we reverse. But again, I'm, I'm, I tend to assume a trend is going to continue until proven otherwise. It is worth noting that at the close, as the S&P uh, closed pretty much toward the uh, at or near the highs of the day, the uh, uh, RSI on the daily chart is above 70. So the S&P is once again overbought for the first time since uh, September. Uh, if you look back here in all last two times, the S&P has been overbought uh, over the last couple, uh, last six months or so, uh, really after the, the March low was here. And it first became overbought the third, fourth week in August, which meant we went up another week and accelerated up before we, we topped out. In June of last year, we became overbought. And it was a couple of days later that we gapped down. And it really didn't get much further than that, but certainly was a couple of weeks of backing and filling before we resumed the uptrend. It really took about six weeks, seven weeks before we eventually broke to, uh, to new highs again. So I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but I do know when something becomes overbought, it immediately gets into my list of let's see what happens and look for signals of reversing, look for signals of mean reversion. I think that's where we're at right now with the S&P. One of the warning signs we talked about, and I know on last uh, the, the last show, I think earlier this week, we sort of uh, touched on some of these, but you know, the breadth has been uh, a little less confirming up until the last couple of days. Last week, we had the S&P going higher, uh, which is what we see here. But then if you look at this first line in green, that's the common stock only advanced decline line. So it's looking at the entire New York Stock Exchange, only the common stocks, not things like closed end funds and other things. And it's looking at how they're confirming it. And basically the cumulative advanced decline lines had not been breaking out. So there's a bit of a divergence. It wasn't as much of a huge divergence. I would call it more of like a non-confirmation where the market's going higher, but the breadth line is not confirming that. Um, that's actually been invalidated. That's been negated because these advanced decline lines have now all across the board broken to new highs. So confirming new highs in stocks. So the breadth 
which had been a little questionable, a little less bullish. I think across the board, you could describe it as, uh, as very bullish here. Another way the breadth has been uh, pretty constructive is the new highs. So in the last couple of days, it's not updated for today yet, but I would anticipate a similar reading. Uh, but yesterday, the day before, you had about 20 to 22 percent of the S&P members making new 52-week highs, which is very, very healthy. That's actually much higher than what we've had through much of this run. If you look back, though, the last couple times we've had a spike like this, it's been before a bit of a, of a pause, right? You had here in September before we came off a little bit. You had that on the spike higher in November. We really didn't get much lower for a couple of weeks, but it sort of was a, was a, a breathing uh, you know, just a couple of breaths before we uh, before we continued higher. Uh, but overall, really just speaks to the overall strength, speaks to broad participation and a lot of stocks making new highs, which is a sign of a healthy market, not an unhealthy market. Uh, you know, we've talked about the percent of stocks above the 200 day over 90 percent, which is extremely high. If you look back and, and know your market history, it's pretty rare that that many stocks are above their 200 day moving average. And it's been that way since uh, really late November. That's when he broke above 90% for the most part, it's remained above their uh, unabated. So it really speaks to the broad advance. You know, I've thought about that as a contrarian signal of sorts, thinking that the market had become overextended, but I, the market is proving otherwise. The market is telling you an uptrend is in place until, uh, until uh, indications uh, 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 go away from that. And overall it's remained positive. Where we have seen a bit of an alleviation of the euphoric readings have been with sentiment. So the AAII survey came out yesterday. We didn't mention it on the show, but bullish reading down a couple points to 42%, bears increasing down to 33.5%. So the spread between these two is actually narrowing. It's the narrow, narrowest it's been since early November. And you've seen a steady decline over the last couple of months in the bullish reading. So still pretty high, over 40% on, you know, as much above the average reading on something like this, but it's not the extreme euphoric reading we had in early November, which was similar to the extreme bullish reading we had at the end of 2017, which concerns me a bit here. And if you're thinking about what a top could look like, you had the big spike in bullish readings, almost 60%, and then we've steadily declined. And that's kind of what you had going into the January 2018 high before a bit of a pullback. And again, it wasn't the end of the world, but it certainly was the, you know, ended up being a, a meaningful top for, uh, for a little while. So it's something certainly to pay attention to. Let's go through some of the ratios here, a couple if we can get to them. Consumer offense versus defense, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples on a cap-weighted basis and on an equal-weighted basis, both of those confirming uh, high, suggesting institutions are really all in and, uh, and riding equities higher. Semiconductors continuing to push higher. I could see that being a bit of a safe haven uh, if the market, uh, you know, if this group tends to do very well and hold up, I would think if, uh, if the overall, if the market starts to struggle, I could see technology as a whole doing well and semiconductors doing well as a bit of a flight to safety, but we're not really seeing it uh, yet here. And then finally, I just want to finish off. I know we're about out of time here, but one more I wanted to hit was uh, this one, right? So we've continued to see a weaker dollar. We're continuing to see U.S. stocks underperform. We've been talking about this for a while. So I hope you have been focusing on some opportunities outside the U.S. Make sure you're diversified because as we're going to see in a bit, things like China are actually working out very well, continuing to break to new highs. So I hope you're not missing those opportunities outside of some of the stocks you know here in the U.S. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.